All right, well, this morning we're actually going to participate in an object lesson together. So, and the outside rows, uh, there's a stack of paper, and I want you to take a, one sheet of paper and pass it down. Everybody needs a sheet of paper. I know some of you who have begun teaching, you're thinking, oh, no, not another object lesson, but you're going to have to get over it and have to participate today uh, with us in this object lesson. So everybody get a piece of paper? Everybody has one? Hold up your piece of paper. Everybody needs one. Wave it like this. Two little circles. <laughs> you got a piece of paper? Good. Now I want you to follow my instructions. Do not ask any questions. Just do what I ask you to do. Simple enough. Fold the piece of paper in half. Fold the piece of paper in half. Take the upper right hand corner and tear a little piece off of that corner. Fold the piece of paper again in half. Take the bottom right hand corner and tear a little piece off of that corner. Fold the piece of paper in half again. Tear off the upper right hand corner. Take all the little confetti in your hand like this. <laughs> Bring it down like this. Close it up in your hand, put it in your pocket, because Cindy will kill you if you throw it in. <laughs> Take your piece of paper, I want you to open it up. I want you to hold it up in the air. And look around. Show everybody your piece of paper. Why are you people so weird? Why why can't you follow simple instructions? You're all different. You're all different. I mean, weren't you all listening to the same instructions I was giving? Huh? I mean, were you listening to the instructions I was giving? Well, this object lesson kind of points out the fact that each and every one of us hear with different ears and we receive sometimes with a different heart and we all look at the world through different lenses. We're not all the same. We all have different perspectives, partially formed through our childhood, the community we grew up in, the church, the tradition which we were raised what was pumped into our heads since we were youth. Each and every one of us carry that with us. It's the way we see the world. It's also the way we see scripture. Each and every one of us, when we read the text, receive something differently. We're like a bunch of snowflakes. So hold it up and say, I'm a snowflake. Come on, have a little fun with me, come on. That was really bad, corny and hokey, but uh, I'm so glad that you're a snowflake with me today. You see, there are so many different perspectives. Joe is a flake, yes, I agree with that. He's not a snowflake, he's just a flake. But, but I mean, when we approach the text sometimes, we look at it, um, each of us are given a different perspective, which is part of its beauty. Now, one of the things we could do is I could ask you to walk around the room and find a snowflake similar to yours, because there are a few of you out there that are similar. Now, what happens in the midst of the world is when all snowflakes that are alike start getting together, they somehow feel like they have authority, or they have all the right answers over everybody else. Have you ever seen that happen in our world? I see it on TV a whole lot right now, don't you? We're all snowflakes in Tampa. We're all snowflakes in Charlotte. I don't know what went on in those cities, but there are a whole lot of similar snowflakes in those places. And both think they have the right answers over the other. It's the same way within the church and when we approach the text, the Word of God. 
We hear it's the authority of the church, and it is. We hear that it's the sacred teachings of the church. We hear that the book is holy, amen? And it's a gift for us, amen? Yet each of us read the text through different lenses, and guess what? The Holy Spirit leads us to different interpretations. We cannot take that book, that holy book, and read it just unto ourselves. We're called to read the text and scripture together in community. If I'm left to my own devices, I'm only going to read the Bible through my snowflake lenses. And I'm going to think that everybody else is wrong. But there are those out there who believe that the Bible is inerrant, infallible. Amen? I mean, you've heard that before? As if God's hand came down from the heaven and grabbed Jeremiah or Luke or John's hand and wrote literally every word and dotted every period and I and all those types of things. Now, the Holy Spirit uses God's creation and God's people to disclose God's self to us. Amen? And so God had selected and chosen and worked through these men and women throughout the ages that we might experience what God is doing in the midst of the world. How God has disclosed God's self to us. Amen? And yet sometimes I think we've limited God with our own perspectives and agendas and ideas. Hmm. And so we go about taking bricks and building walls, erecting them to protect God's word from the world. Amen? Big, strong walls. Okay, they're not so strong, but they're big. And we erect them like this. And to protect ourselves, we build these towers. Kind of reminds me of the, the, the castle and the tower and the princess up in the castle. Uh, we erect these walls and, and we want to protect the princess because we don't want the world to get a hold of it because we know. <laughs> And nobody should touch the princess. And, and it reminds me in that story that, that these towers are erected. They, we put the princess up in the tower because we don't want any of those princes to get a hold of her, let alone any dragons, right? So we build the world walls and we erect them. And we say, this is literally how things have to be. Because, you know, we do need to protect God. We need to defend God. Amen? Amen. We need to fight for what's right. And every brick in this tower testifies to truth. And so we need to protect the princess. So we put the princess, which is the Bible, up in the tower so that nobody else can get it. Only if we let them in. Only if we let them in. We erect these towers based on facts, literalism, inerrancy, infallibility. And I'm not just picking on the conservative side of the church because the ultra-liberal side of the church is doing the same thing. They're saying, we're reading the text, and factually we can prove that everything in there is not true. But they're building the same tower. Do we need to defend God? No. Then why do we do this? Is God's word, are we supposed to be defenders of God's word, or is God's word big enough to work and live and move on its own? And so we have to stand behind the powers that we've erected. This kind of literalism, this, this uh, factual-based life, and we need to let the walls come down. That was really good, by the way. Moving your feet just the right time. That we might set the Word of God free in our own lives and in the lives of the world. Amen? You see, throughout the Scripture, we are told that the Word of God is inspired. In the Greek, that word inspired literally means God breathed. When you think about God's breath, and you look through the whole testimony of Scripture, we find God's breath time and time again. And it's always creating and renewing and liberating and forming and recreating and making new. In Genesis, we hear in the very beginning, the creation of the whole world, that God's spirit, the Ruach, hovers over the waters of the deep. God's very breath is there. It's active. It's alive. It's moving forward. When we hear about Jeremiah, this young man who's sowing sycamore trees, and, and God comes to him and says, go to Israel and proclaim, proclaim a word to them. And Jeremiah turns to the Lord and says, Lord, I'm just a young man. I can't do it. And God says literally in the Hebrew, but my breath is upon you. Speak what I give you to speak. In other words, God is going to work in the midst of the life of Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah doesn't need to sit in the ivory tower that he's created. He's been liberated by God. God will be with Jeremiah. God's very breath is moving. It's alive. It's, it's living in the midst of the world. When we experience it in the life of Jesus Christ who came to be with us, God in flesh, in his baptism, he comes up out of the water and we see the spirit descending upon him and the voice of God from the heavens saying, Behold, this is my son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. God is doing a good act in the midst of our world, in the midst of our community, and God uses each and every one of us as vessels for his goodness, for his life, and for his love. Amen? Those brothers and sisters who have testified to the work of God in the midst of the world, who have written down God's self-disclosure for us, inspired by the Holy Spirit, God breathed into their lives. It's not just a book. It's not just a cover. It's not just chapters. It's not just words on a page. God's Word is alive. And unless it's lived, well, then it's just a book on a shelf. I think it's time we took the Bible out of the tower, my brothers and sisters. And we actually trust God again. And trust the power of the Holy Spirit. To liberate us to actually experience the text once again, fresh and new. And let the text, God's word, God's gift to us all, breathe on us again. That we may have life. And that we might see the gift of God's revelation through his word, his written word as a means of grace that we may embody it in our lives in the midst of the world not look at it as a legal document or a constitution or a list of rules but a story that we've been invited to participate in and an invitation to participate in reading God's word in ways where we're not limited to our questions I mean why are we afraid to question the text is God not big enough to be questioned? Why are we afraid to, to, to look into our Bibles and to highlight things and to write and, and to question and, and to make comments? Why? Why do we have to believe that the, that the Word of God has to be interpreted one way? It never has been. As a matter of fact, that's its beauty, amen? If every one of us read a section of scripture today and each of us shared, just like we do on Thursday night, what the Holy Spirit is saying to us that day, it would all be different. We'd look like the snowflakes that we made earlier. And that's part of God's beauty. God cannot be contained to a list of rules or defined by human beings. We cannot erect a tower to protect it. God's going to tear it down every time. Because God's word is alive. God is living and God's breath is for us. That we may share that good news and God's grace with the whole world. I think the world is hungry for the church to actually say, come and experience the story that we've all been invited to be a part of. And don't come hesitant. Ask your questions. Challenge it. But breathe it and let it breathe upon you that your life may be transformed. Inerrant, infallible, inspired, God's word is alive. God's word is God for you. God's word comes to us through vessels, just like each of us here today. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. I love that text in Luke chapter 1 where he starts right off the bat and he says, you know what? This story is so good. I'm taking all the best things that I experienced, all the best things that I heard, and I wanted to get it down so that you wouldn't lose it. You wouldn't lose it. But that you might be participants in this good work that God is doing in our midst. How spectacular is that, huh? It's a collection, our Bible, the Bible that we have, that we recognize within the Christian tradition is a, a collection of 66 different books over thousands of years. 
My good buddy Brian McLaren says, too many times the church views the scripture as if it's a constitution, and it's not a constitution, it's an apostolic library. And you know what's beautiful about the image of a library is you come into the library to check things out and experience it and explore. And you've been given great freedom to do that. There's a great biblical scholar by the name of Walter Brueggemann, Old Testament scholar. And I was reading Walter Brueggemann this week, and he made the comment that a lot of people view uh, the scriptures as the authority for the church. Most of you say, yeah, right? Amen? Okay. He says, I would like to change that perspective a little. In other words, rather than using the word of, of the authority for the church, I'd like us to look at the scripture as the authorizing document. The authorizing document. In other words, it's inviting us to participate and what God has already done, is doing, and will continue to do. Rather than looking at it as a legal document, or a list of rules, to view the scripture as the very breath of God, God breathed, and to allow the breath of God to so consume and fill our lives in this great adventure of faith that we are on together that we have been given an invitation to participate in the very things of God. That's what everyone in the Bible is giving testimony to. How God has revealed God's self. That we may know God. And that we may live as God's children in the midst of the world. So let the walls come back. Liberate the scripture. Because God's word is alive. To the glory of God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.